Welcome back to the introduction to particle systems. In this video, we are going to kind of branch away from particles, but not really. We're still going to be talking about particle effects, but not necessarily particle systems. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Well, in this case, we have, if I go into game mode and turn on real-time feedback, we have this really nice fire pit taking place in our level, but there's a certain problem in that the lighting doesn't reflect our fire at all. That's right. Obviously, with a fire of this magnitude coming <laughs> from the little fountain there, we would obviously have shadows dancing all around the room caused by those pillars around the fountain. That's right. So what we're going to do is create the lighting effect that's going to finish off this, uh, this whole effect. It has nothing to do with particles, but it's what really brings everything together. So for now, let's turn off real-time feedback. And it's not quite as simple as just bringing in a light and saying you're done if you want it to look really sharp. Now, here's, here's a question you've got to ask yourself. How realistic do you need this to look, and what's your trade-off in performance? Because what I want to do is create a dynamic light that moves around, has a little bit of a wiggle back and forth as the flames kind of flicker, and pulsates a little bit, kind of flickering up and down in its intensity. Now, that is a more expensive effect than just bringing in a static light, if you will. Right. So you're going to have to ask yourself, what's going to be prudent for your particular application. But let's go ahead and grab our dynamic light. I'm going to go into my uh, browser. We'll jump into the Actor Classes browser to be specific. I'll expand light. I'll expand point light and grab a point light movable. Let's close out our browser. I'll right click here on the floor and grab add point light movable here. Let's get out of game mode so that I can move it around a little more easily. And I'm going to put this over here into the fire. Now, already we see one very small problem in that it doesn't seem to be casting any shadows, and that's the whole reason it's here, is to cast shadows. Well, we need to be a little bit specific about what is going to cast shadows and what isn't. In this case, these columns are going to be a big factor as far as our shadows are concerned. So I'm going to open up their properties, and under Static Mesh Component, we're going to scroll down to Lighting, and we're going to check B Cast Dynamic Shadow. And as soon as we turn that on, we start getting a dynamic shadow. You might also want to turn this on for these columns as well. So we'll go ahead and open up their properties as well. We'll do the exact same thing. B, cast dynamic shadow, pink, and now they have some, uh, some properties too. So anybody who you need to be included might even go for the dragon, but we can probably get away without it. Uh, it's, it'd be kind of a tough call, but it'd be up to you. So let's go ahead and... Uh, Oh, well, now nah, I won't worry about the dragon. I would, but see, <laughs> the catch to that is that if I include the dragon, I also have to include the fountain because we'd end up with light spilling and a really weird shadow here on yep. the floor. So I'm not going to worry about the dragon. The columns will be enough. All right, so uh, let's change a few other properties of the light while we're in here. Clearly, we wouldn't want a whole bunch of white light scattered around our room from a big orange fire. So let's uh, make our light. So, ooh, that may be a little too orange. Let me pull that back just a little bit. I think that'll work. I'm picky about my light colors, so I'll spare you guys from sitting here over and over and over and tweaking that. Now, uh, if you are wanting to adjust the range of your lighting, keep this in mind. Uh, just because of the, uh, the way that the uh, shadows are being projected, if I pull my radius down, like to say 512, your shadows will disappear in this particular case. So we really want to project that light far and wide. We'll leave this up at 1024. But if you want to bring your light in, tighten it up a little bit, take your fall-off exponent and push this up. I'm going to really crank it all the way up to 6. So it's going to be really bright here at the core, and then the amount of light is going to drop off dramatically as we get away from the, uh, the center of the light itself. Okay, now we're not done. We want this light to move, and uh, kind of an interesting thing about moving lights when you bring them in is by default they don't move. And that's because if you go under their movement tab, their physics property is set to Fizz None. You want to set this to Fizz Interpolating so that it will actually uh, do some sort of motion. Now, how are we going to get that motion? Well, we're going to do it all through Matinee. So let's pop into Kismet. I still have the light selected. Keep that in mind. Let's create a new Matinee. We'll zoom in on it so we can see it. I'll double-click it to open up Matinee. Now, I have Matinee kind of squashed down, which is going to be really handy here in just a moment, but when you first open it up, it's probably going to look something kind of like this. Uh, let's go ahead and get uh, Kismet out of the way in the background, and we're going to uh, just verify, hey, the light's selected. That's good. Let's turn off real time. We don't really need it. I'm going to add a new empty group, which I will call Light Jitter. And uh, just double-check over in Kismet that it did get all connected and the group's in place and everybody's happy. Now, let's add a movement track to make our light move around, because that's the whole thing here. We want the effect of the light kind of waggling around and uh, creating that interesting moving shadow from the flame. 
So now that we have that in place, we need to be able to uh, move between keys inside of Matinee and move our light around to change its position over time. So what I'm going to do is close down my properties window. I'm going to take the Matinee window and really squash it down. It's going to be tiny. I really only need to see the movement track, and that's about it. So we'll just get as much screen space as we can out of this. I think that's going to work. I'm also going to zoom out a little bit. And we don't need five seconds of animation. Uh, it'd take too long to do, because I'm planning on a lot of keyframes. But I will choose kind of an odd number, because I don't want it to look too regular. You'll find that, just in my experience, I find that people can like pick up on one-second intervals pretty quickly. So do something like 1.3, because that breaks it up just enough to put it out of uh, most people's uh, reach. Now I'll zoom in, so that this is taking up uh, most of our little area here. And I think with that, we're ready to go in here and start animating. So... Let's get in here where we can see the light, and uh, there we go. If I click on something in the view, because we're not in real-time mode, my particles will disappear, which is kind of handy for me. Now, also, keep in mind that I am snapping to 0.1 second interval. That means I can only have a maximum of 13 keys as I go across here, uh, not including the one at zero, of course. So let's move our uh, time slider up to about 0.1. We'll press Enter to key create a keyframe, and it gives me a warning to make sure your movement track is selected. There we go. So there's our first keyframe, and I'm just going to move us slightly, like so. Now, it might not be a bad idea every now and then to turn on your fire and make sure you don't move your light beyond the extent of your fire. That wouldn't necessarily be the end of the world if you did, but you'll find it looks better if you kind of keep that constrained, uh, keep your movement down to a minimum. Uh, let's uh, scroll over to about point two. We'll press enter and create a new key and give us a motion. And we'll just, co just really continue this pattern, making erratic star-like patterns here inside the extent of our fire. That's really all we're doing. It's pretty cut and dry. So move over, press enter, uh, get some motion. Move over, press enter, get some motion. Pretty exciting, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can tell you're excited. <laughs> you can read my mind. I can read your mind. That's right. Fortunately, we only have just a few more left. So, yeah, things get really quiet when I'm doing the same thing over and over again. And, of course, the nice thing is you'll be able to basically set your selection loop range and play this back. Yeah, and see what it's really looking like, yeah. which is great. All right, almost done. We're so close. Well, sort of, because uh, what I'm going to do is put in my last key, we'll get some sort of motion, and then we're going to come around here to the side axis, and I'm going to add some forward and back to this, which is easy. We'll just click on maybe every other key, and maybe pull this one forward, and then this one uh, we'll pull backward, and maybe jump all the way over here, I guess, and we'll pull this one forward. So, you know, that's giving us our waggle back and forth for our shadows, which will be nice and important when we get into it. So just scrub back through and see what that looks like. Okay, and let's jump up here. Oh, there we go. The viewport didn't want to update. Probably be better if I had real time on, but that's okay. We'll push this back a little bit. And we'll jump up here. And we'll pull this guy kind of forward. And we'll jump up here, and we'll pull this one kind of backward. And I think that'll do it. Really, we just made kind of a, a knot, a little ball of keyframes mm -hmm. here. Okay, I think that's going to work. Let's take our uh, loop section, and we'll expand it to cover the whole timeline, and hit play. And I guess if I do some real-time feedback in the view, don't look at the light. Look over here at the shadows and see what they're doing. Kind of so, reminds me of a fire. Yeah, kind of reminds me of a fire. And at this point, you know, if you're thinking maybe it's moving too much in one direction or another, you could go in and tweak those keyframes. Or if, yeah, or if you want to take that uh, last keyframe and get a little bit closer to what the first keyframe is, so that you don't have such a very abrupt, sudden jump between the end and the beginning. Well, that I'm not worried about because we're actually going to play it backwards when we're done. Mm -hmm. So instead of get, see, right here we have looping motion on our timeline when we hit play, mm -hmm. but in the actual level we're going to have pendulumatic motion. Where we're going to play forward and then we'll play straight backwards. Ooh, so, look at you go! Yeah, so you won't notice <laughs> anything like that. Very I'm, nice. I'm not worried about it. So I guess with that, as far as for right now, we're done with matinee. We'll be back in it in just a moment. But let's go ahead and set up our uh, effect over inside of Kismet so that we can 
can get this actually playing, we need some sort of event that will trigger when the level starts. And so if we jump over to new event, we have the level startup. So as soon as the level starts, this will be fired. We're going we're to connect this to play, and this is where things really do get clever. After we've played through, we're going to take completed and connect that to reverse. So as soon as we get done, we're going to play backwards. Then when we hit aborted, which that's almost a misnomer, because when you read aborted, you think that we've stopped playback for some reason. That's not what it means. That means you've played back to the beginning when you're playing backwards. We're going to take that and connect that back over to play. So now we get this infinite loop where we're always either playing forward or playing backward. It really is that easy. Very nice. So let's close out of Kismet. Let's give this a quick test. And it says that lighting needs to be rebuilt, and I imagine it does, but we are getting our effect, like so. Excellent. That looks really good, too. Yeah. That looks very nice. Okay, so let's get out of here. There, We could expand upon the effect just a little bit by uh, making the light pulsate, kind mm-hmm. of flicker in terms of its brightness. So let's go back into Kismet. Let's double-click on Matinee. And we still have our light jitter group, which is exactly what we'll need because it's connected to our light. Let's right-click, and we'll add a new float property track and set this down to brightness and click OK. Now I'm going to try to make this as easy as I can. Let's start off with our time slider all the way back here at zero. I'll get rid of the Matinee window. Or the Kismet window? I knew what I meant. <laughs> you knew what I meant. <laughs> uh, I hope you know what you meant. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and press Enter. Now, uh, let's check this guy's default value. So set value is currently set to 1. And that'll work. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, is slide us to, say, the fourth keyframe in our little stack here. And then we'll jump back down to brightness. And I'm going to press Enter again. And then, again, we'll skip 2. Jump down to brightness. Press Enter again. And, oh, wait a minute. That's, wait. Yeah, okay, that'll work. I'm sorry. I was thinking ahead. I thought I, I had messed something up, but I haven't yet. I'm still working on messing it up. All right, so boom, there we go. So now we've got these anchors where we're holding the value at 1. So now let's go to, uh, say, maybe right about here, and we'll place a new keyframe. And we're going to set this to, I don't know, maybe point, um, not too low. You don't want to really set no, it too low. Kind of let's like point seven. And so you can see we're kind of dimming, and then we go back up. And what I'm going to do is hold down, uh, I don't need to hold down control. What I want to do is come over here to edit, and we're going to duplicate selected keys. And we're going to drag this guy over to here, and then we'll do it again, and we'll drag this guy over to here, and then we'll do it again, and we'll drag. So, you know, I've got this pattern going on. Let's move the time slider over. I guess I should put one more in, so... Let's duplicate one more time, and we'll drag him all the way to the very end. Now, let's just play that back and see what it looks like. Yeah, you get a little bit of flicker going on with the light. It's a little bit too regular, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, what we could we could add another keyframe, or as an alternative, we could maybe grab this key in the middle and maybe set his value uh, up to, I don't know, 0.8 instead of 0.7. We could take this key and, uh, who knows, maybe push it to like 1.1 so it actually flares up just a little bit. So we get just a little bit of variation so we don't just have the same two values. And you don't need much variation because you don't have that many keys. Okay, now with that, let's uh, come back over here and play in the map again. Yeah, very nice. And there's the bulk of our effect. In fact, I think we're done. So we still need to rebuild our lighting, but we're going to actually do that off camera. So when we come back into the next video, our lighting will be rebuilt, and that's going to wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot.